Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, G. S. Raju. I serve at the University of Texas, Medi Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in the Department of Gastroenterology and also serve as the editor in chief of Video GIE. Today I'm really honored to interview Dr. Larry Brandt, uh, Emeritus Chief of the Montefiore GI uh, Department and also serves as the Professor of Medicine at Albert Einstein Medical Center. And uh, I'm one of your fans. <laughs> uh, most of my gastroenterology that I've learned is from Fortran and you being the editor. Uh, I admire you for doing that uh, job. And uh, also learned a lot from your focal points in GIE. Thank so today, as part of this interview, we want to help the junior faculty and fellows uh, learn about you, uh, what inspired you to become a physician. So let's start with your early career. Well, I, can't t I cannot tell you a specific fact uh, or event that uh, led me to say, wow, I want to be a physician. But when I was maybe six or seven years old, uh, I had, like many other kids in the Bronx, uh, allergies. And I went to a, my mother brought me to an allergist, and uh, I got uh, some testing, and I got some shots. And when I used to go to the doctor's office, I was fascinated by his books in his library. And what wound up happening is that at the age of eight or nine, I would walk into his office, take an anatomy book, and start to, to read through it. By the time I was about nine or 10, I had every uh, origin and insertion of all the muscles memorized. Mm -hmm. And I had a pretty good awareness of anatomic organs, where they belonged, and uh, when he would examine me, uh, I would ask him, you know, which organ he was feeling and so forth. So uh, the, the body to me was sort of like a puzzle, and each puzzle had its right place, and it was a very organized kind of a structure. And um, I guess because of my fascination with the body, uh, I wanted to go to medical school. And uh, I obviously did go to medical school, but I didn't have a specific focus uh, for gastroenterology. Um, I was always pretty good with my hands. Uh, I did a lot of uh, wood carving and sculpting, and um, I wanted a career in surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love the concept of being in the body. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to medical school to essentially to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. That lasted until I had my first rotation on surgery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, I, I love the body, but I didn't, on my particular exposure, I didn't like the way the uh, surgeons thought mm -hmm about disease. It just, it wasn't deep enough for me, although I love the technical stuff. And therefore I was sort of, um, you know, floundering around a little bit. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And uh, I took an elective uh, as a student in surgery um, and trauma surgery, mm -hmm. because that was really wet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walked into the dog lab and I had an anaphylactic reaction to the dogs. So they carried me out of the dog lab and I spent the rest of my uh, elective time doing pulmonary mechanic, uh -huh. uh, pulmonary mechanics and ventilation studies. But I, I still loved surgery. So um, what happened was uh, I go into my internship year and um, I take uh, an elective in gastroenterology. Mm -hmm. I was the first intern in the history of Mount Sinai Hospital. Mm -hmm. 
to elect gastroenterology. Mm -hmm. You know, it, in those years, we're talking about uh, 1968 to 69, mm -hmm. gastroenterology wasn't a sexy topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, endocrinology was sexy, if you can believe mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Uh, cardiology was sexy, hematology was sexy, mm -hmm. but not gastroenterology. But, you know, I, I took this elective because I wanted to learn how to do a sigmoidoscopy mm -hmm. because I thought that uh, that was part of a physical examination. Mm -hmm. So I'm back to knowing mm -hmm. the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I get interviewed by the chief of GI, Dr. Henry Janowitz. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of the younger people don't know who he, who he is or was, uh, but he was the chief of gastroenterology at Mount Sinai Hospital and an expert in pancreatic function studies and inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. So uh, because I was the first uh, intern ever to uh, elect gastroenterology, mm -hmm. he wouldn't allow that unless he interviewed me. Mm -hmm. So I got interviewed, and uh, he said, why do you want to... Uh, take gastroenterology, and I said, this is, this is very important because it shows how good I was in predicting my career. I said, I want to take gastroenterology because I know for a fact, listen to that arrogance, uh -huh. <laughs> I know for a fact mm -hmm. that gastroenterology is the one subspecialty in medicine I don't want to do, uh -huh. and, but I want to learn how to do a rigid sigmoidoscopy. Uh -huh. Because I think that's part of the physical exam. So he said, uh, well, um, all right, I'll let you go to the clinic. And Dr. Sacker, David Sacker, another great <laughs> IBD doctor, and Dr. Danny Present, another great IBD doctor, they, would, they had just finished their training. Uh, they will teach you how to do a sigmoidoscopy. I said, you know, Dr. Janowitz, uh, that's great. But that's not good enough. I said, you're one of the most renowned gastroenterologists in the world. I'd be a fool if I didn't ask you to round with you in the afternoons on your private patients. Uh -huh. So he looked at me and he said, wow, you have a lot of nerve. <laughs> but he used the word for nerve that starts with a B and it ends with an S, and there were three other letters in between. Uh, but he, he allowed me to do that. And uh, I made rounds with him every day. I learned how to do a sigmoidoscopy. And at the end of the one month, he said to me, how would you like to be a GI fellow in three years? Uh -huh. And I said, I can't think of anything I'd like to do more. Uh -huh. And that's how I got into gastroenterology. So for the younger people, I would say, you know, it's, it's all sometimes um, it's just a matter of luck and circumstance. You experience something, and you never know where that's going to tell you. So don't make any judgments at all until you get mm -hmm. the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Somewhat long answer to a somewhat no, short it's question. Beautiful. It's beautiful. So, so what happened then? You joined him? And so I, him? I did my, I, I had a very strange career uh, early on because uh, I was also uh, chief resident uh, in medicine. I was chief resident in my second year. Uh, today they use different terminology. Mm -hmm. So it, there was internship and then three years of residency. Uh -huh. Now they'd call that four years right. of residency. But in my second year of residency, I was the chief resident. And then they asked me to be chief resident for my, in my third year as uh -huh. well uh -huh. of residency. And uh, that was with Dr. Saul Burson, um, who invented the radioimmunoassay. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did in that year is from 7 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock in the morning, I was chief resident, and mm -hmm. I did all the evaluations mm -hmm. the patients uh, admitted. Then at 9 o'clock, I became a GI fellow, changed mm -hmm. my hat, became mm -hmm. a GI fellow. Mm -hmm. At 5 o'clock, I changed my hat again. I became a chief resident. I uh -huh. did sign-out rounds. Then I went home, had dinner with my uh, new wife. We were married for a couple of months. And after dinner, I went to the Bronx VA, uh -huh. and I did research on radioimmunoassay with Dr. Uh, Burson and Dr. Yallo uh -huh. until about midnight, 12.30. Uh -huh. Then I came back, uh -huh. had my two or three hours of sleep, uh -huh. went to work the next morning, uh -huh. 
And I did that for a year. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was one of the greatest <laughs> years of my life. Mm -hmm. So um, that was my, my house staff training. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the Army. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough uh, through, just through luck, that I made contact with uh, H. Worth Boyce, mm -hmm. who was the chief of GI for the Army. Mm -hmm. And after a few minute conversation with him on the phone, he made me the gastroenterologist uh, at the Fifth General uh, Hospital uh, in Stuttgart, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was there for two years in that capacity doing EGDs and uh, other things in GI. But I had only had one year of GI fellowship. Mm -hmm. That was when I was chief resident. Mm -hmm. I was chief resident and I was a GI fellow. And then I had to go in the Army. Mm -hmm. I went in the Army, I did GI for two years. And then what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So I come to DDW, mm -hmm. uh, which was in San Francisco at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in uh, 1974. Mm -hmm. And do I look for a job? Do I look for a mm -hmm. fellowship? Mm -hmm. Henry Janowitz says to me, I'll give you another year of fellowship if you want, mm -hmm. but I can't pay you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a major problem. Somebody, uh, Jerry Way, actually. Uh -huh. Jerry Way uh, and another doctor named Sal Vernais, uh, who was a hepatologist, introduced me to Les Bernstein, who was the chief of GI at Montefiore. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you know, I'll give you a job as an attending. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked for about literally three minutes. Mm -hmm. I took the job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I took the job and uh, became an attending mm -hmm. at uh, Montefiore. And that was in 1974. Mm -hmm. And, but I didn't have my boards. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even qualified for my mm -hmm. boards. So Bernstein writes a letter to the board and he says, Listen, this guy's going to be doing grand rounds. He's going to be in a supervised situation. He's going to be teaching every day. He's going to be learning every day. And my job was literally to teach endoscopy, uh, to read, study, and prepare for conferences, mm -hmm. and do research. I think that he should be allowed to have this count as his mm -hmm. second year of fellowship. Mm -hmm. The board said yes. Mm -hmm. I carved another year for that. And I wound up doing every single grand rounds with Bernstein, mm -hmm. but every single grand rounds for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got to do a lot of reading mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, I've stayed there ever since. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the way I came to know about you is reading Fortran and your chapter on the blood supply to the gut and issues with the right. gut. So take me through your career from a junior attending to a chief, your contributions, and what excited and how did you do that work? You know, you did a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, I believe some work in laser, some work on trans, the fecal transplant, and work right. on the small bowel blood supply. So well, take me through that. You know, I think here again, it's a matter of where fortune takes you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met a surgeon, so here mm -hmm. we're back to mm -hmm. surgery mm -hmm. again. Um, and it, it, you know, just to, to deviate for a second, my next door roommate, um, I didn't express that very well, the, the guy who lived next door to me in medical mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. um, he did research with a surgeon mm -hmm. and he had a great time. Mm -hmm. Uh, my research was, you know, didn't work out so well in mm -hmm. the trauma mm -hmm. department, as I told you. But as it turns out, the person who next door to me did research with the surgeon, mm -hmm. that surgeon was at Montefiore. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Scott Bowley. Mm -hmm. And Scott Bowley's area of expertise was ischemic diseases of the gut mm -hmm. and vascular lesions of the mm -hmm. gut. And he described the angioectasia, mm -hmm. although then he called it vascular ectasia. Uh, and he described colon ischemia mm -hmm. as a reversible disease. It used to be thought of, prior to his description, only as an irreversible mm -hmm. disease. And he 
took me under his wing and mm -hmm. he said, there isn't a gastroenterologist in the world that knows anything about this area. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make you the expert. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Bowling. Mm -hmm. And um, that became a major focus of my career. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I spent my entire career doing work with him, mm -hmm. and he was the one who taught me how to give oral presentations mm -hmm. and uh, how to write a coherent, grammatically correct sentence mm -hmm. and how to edit manuscripts. Mm -hmm. I know that because when I gave him a manuscript, it came back looking like it was bathed in blood, mm -hmm. which is now what I do to other people. <laughs> <laughs> but so again, fortune smiled upon me, mm -hmm. and I was lucky I got involved with that. Mm -hmm. So that was the ischemic and the vascular stuff. Um, and then I, I took that farther uh, with some of my own mm -hmm. uh, ideas, but uh, uh, the credit goes to him for mm -hmm. taking me through that. And. Um, the C. difficile story and mm -hmm. the fecal transplant story, um, that was just the patient. Uh, this was probably oh, 1990, mm -hmm. I guess, mm -hmm. uh, with a bad C. difficile. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said to me, you know, um, this disease, prior to this disease, I was in perfect health. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I got, uh, I think it was sinusitis or bronchitis mm -hmm. or something. I was given an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've had this terrible C. difficile infection. I stop uh, treatment for it, it comes back. Mm -hmm. I start treatment, it gets better. And it mm -hmm. goes back and forth and back and forth. It's been seven months now. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting me. It's depressing me. It's depleting my bank account. Mm -hmm. Could you please come up with something? Uh -huh. And I said... Give me a few minutes. And I literally in the office went like this. About three minutes goes by and I said, you know, I just thought of something great. I think it's great, but what do you think? And I said, you tell me that you were perfect before the antibiotics. And after the antibiotics, you haven't been the same. Mm -hmm. It's pretty reasonable to assume the antibiotics killed some bacteria that were keeping you in good health. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just replace the bacteria? Mm -hmm. I said, you're sitting next to this good-looking guy that you've been married to for 50 years. Mm -hmm. I have to assume, spent so much time together, you exchanged everything possible under the sun. You share forks mm -hmm. and uh, spoons. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. He probably has the bacteria that you had mm -hmm. that were killed by the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just take some of his stool and put mm -hmm. it in you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had no idea it had been done before. Uh -huh. This was an original idea, uh -huh. original in quotes. All right. And she looks at me and she says, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. When can you do it? Mm -hmm. I said, Friday. Mm -hmm. yeah. And her husband says, and I can give you a stool anytime you want. <laughs> okay. I said, why is that? He says, I have a colostomy. <laughs> I said, why? He said, I had colon cancer. Uh -huh. I said, well, Great, we can get the stool, that's fabulous. Uh -huh. Now, there were no IRBs in that time. Uh -huh. uh, I didn't have to get anybody's permission. I had an idea, she wanted to do it, I wanted to do it, we'll do it. Uh -huh. And I did it. Uh -huh. And I did it uh, probably around two, three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh -huh. At uh, 10 o'clock that night, she calls me at home. Uh -huh. She says, I just called to tell you that I don't know what you did when you were inside me. Uh -huh. I haven't felt those good in seven months. And she never had another uh, thing. So I started to think about that, uh -huh. and that's how uh, I started the fecal transplantation. Yeah. That's amazing. It has changed, and I think <laughs> it's going to change a lot of people's lives, for sure. Right. You did some work in Barrett's. Uh, very little. Very little. With the lasers. Yes, right? I did. I did. Um, there were actually two things that... I was the first person to do. Right. Believe it or not, I was the first person with Jerry Way. I mean, I was a uh -huh. fellow on the case. Right. It wasn't me. Right. Uh, to take out a gastric polyp. Uh huh. Right. Uh huh. I, I, and that's an unbelievable uh -huh. thing. Uh huh. You know that uh, uh -huh. I did that. But I did that with Jerry. 
And the other thing was uh, I was the first person to um, actually dissect out an island of Barrett's. Uh -huh. I had a patient with Barrett's epithelium uh -huh. who had terrible heartburn and uh, he was concerned about this. And I looked at it and uh -huh. I said, you know, I think with a laser, mm -hmm. and this was a neodymium yang right. laser, right. I think that um, I could carve out, back to my mm -hmm. carving mm -hmm. days, mm -hmm. I could carve out that little patch mm -hmm. of Barrett's and maybe if we get rid of that and we put you on a, an acid suppressing regimen, mm -hmm. when the mucosa grows back, you mm -hmm. won't have the Barrett's anymore. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Should we try it? Mm -hmm. Patient said, as long as you send me a copy of your article. Okay. <laughs> so I tried it and uh, I looked at him again at uh, four weeks, looked great. Uh -huh. I looked at him again at eight weeks, uh -huh. looked great. I said, you know, this is the first time this has been done. I got to wait another four weeks. Mm -hmm. Four weeks later, I scope him, and there's the Barrett's back again. And uh, at this point, I said, you know, it's, I, I had read somewhere that you needed to have acid suppression to heal that mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wasn't acid suppressed enough. Mm -hmm. So this time, I re removed mm -hmm. the, uh, reablated the mm -hmm. uh, Barrett's mm -hmm. with a neodymium Yeg laser. But I proved this time by pH testing that he was aquahedron. Mm -hmm. And 12 weeks later, he didn't have that mm -hmm. lesion. And uh, mm -hmm. I reported this as a letter to the editor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the GIE. Right. Right. That's <laughs> fascinating. So you did a lot for education. You, you did. And uh, I'm sure a lot of, uh, you have a lot of fans who read Fortran, which is one of the two Bibles for gastroenterologists. Tell me a little bit about Fortran, your work with uh, the Fortran textbook. And also, I would want you to share your thoughts and advice to future generations, uh, how to be a good physician, how to be a good gastroenterologist, and how to balance their careers. Well, the Fortran part of that is uh, really easy. Uh, I, along with um, uh, Mark Feldman and Larry Friedman, mm -hmm. um, were, was in charge of a third of the book. Mm -hmm. Each of us had a third of the book. Uh, I did small bowel and colon. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became uh, a matter of taking this body of work and as each chapter was submitted to me, and editing it and making it read well and be understandable. Um, and I took all the skills that I was taught, put them into this, and rewrote probably, in some cases, entire chapters. Mm -hmm. In other cases, sentences or mm -hmm. sections. But I made it flow. Mm -hmm. And every time I changed a word, change the comma to a semicolon, mm -hmm. uh, rephrase something, I thought of all the people that taught me how to do that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. without whom I couldn't have, have mm -hmm. done that. Mm -hmm. So it was, every time I did it, it was like saying thank you and mm -hmm. passing it forward, mm -hmm. and letting somebody else read mm -hmm. a well-constructed sentence. Um, I enjoyed doing that very much. And uh, we have another edition coming out, and mm -hmm. you know we're still doing that. Although now we have some junior editors who are mm -hmm. going to be replacing the right. senior editors. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know that was just another thing that I did, mm -hmm. and I personally um, am more um, concerned with where medicine is today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how the young people are being taught, mm -hmm. uh, what their uh, emphasis is mm -hmm. uh, and on patient care mm -hmm. and how patients are relating to the physician. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bi-directional relationship. Mm -hmm. The doctor to the patient, the mm -hmm. patient to the doctor. And uh, I don't really like the way this direction is going. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this whole thing about seeing more patients and more patients and using computers to generate forms mm -hmm. and having people 
not talk to a patient, mm -hmm. but talk, but look at a computer while they're talking mm -hmm. to the patient who's sitting over there. They're looking over here mm -hmm. and not examining the patient, mm -hmm. not taking a detailed history. What brings you to the office today? Abdominal pain. All right, let's get this CAT scan and, and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. That's lousy medicine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard for me to um, effect what I want others to do because it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I sort of have special dispensation at my medical center uh, because of my age and my seniority mm -hmm. and um, the fact that I would quit if I couldn't do mm -hmm. it the mm -hmm. way I want to do mm -hmm. it. I spend an hour and 15 minutes with every new patient. Mm -hmm and I probably spend 40 minutes with a follow-up patient, mm -hmm. because I talk to them. Mm -hmm. I understand the patients, I understand mm -hmm. their lives, where mm -hmm. the disease fits in. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can take care of a patient unless you know the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, the disease is part of the patient. Absent the patient's social history and personal mm -hmm. story, the disease is just a disease. Mm -hmm. But it becomes much more complex when you mm -hmm. put it in its container of right. the entire patient. So what I would advise the mm -hmm. younger people today to do is to really try and be true to your calling, which is to be a good doctor. To be a good doctor, you have to know the patient, spend the time, and learn how to do a good history, a detailed history, how to do a good physical examination, and understand pathophysiology. We don't do enough pathophysiology. Endoscopy is important, but it's not all of medicine. And uh, I often used to say that the endoscope uh, should not be the long arm of the technician, but it should be the third eye of the clinician. Uh, I think it's important to be a technically gifted endoscopist who knows his mm -hmm. or her limitations mm -hmm. uh, and use that as an extension of what you think is going on. Never put an endoscope into a patient to see what you find. Mm -hmm. Put an endoscope into a patient put an endoscope into a patient to see if what you thought mm -hmm. was going on mm -hmm. is going on, mm -hmm. or if not, what's going on, mm -hmm. and then take care of the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think I would urge people to be a complete doctor. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put. That's thank fantastic. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, it's uh, truly an honor to be with you. My really pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you. My honor. Thank you.